The Awakening, The Resurrection, Leo Tolstoy, Part 8. Chapter 66. Nekludov had four cases in hand. Maslova's appeal, the petition of Theodosia Birukova, the case of Shustova's release by request of Vera Bogodukovskaya, and the obtaining of permission for a mother to visit her son kept in a fortress, also by Bogodukovskaya's request. Since his visit to Maslenikov, especially since his trip to the country, Nekludov felt an aversion for that sphere in which he had been living heretofore and in which the sufferings borne by millions of people in order to secure the comforts and pleasures of a few were so carefully concealed that the people of that sphere did not and could not see these sufferings and consequently the cruelty and criminality of their own lives. Nekludov could no longer keep up relations with these people without reproving himself and yet the habits of his past life the ties of friendship and kinship, and especially his one great aim of helping Maslova and the other unfortunates, drew him into that sphere against his will, and he was compelled to ask the aid and services of people whom he had not only ceased to respect, but who called forth his indignation and contempt. Arriving at St. Petersburg and stopping at his aunt's, the wife of an ex-minister of state, he found himself in the very heart of the aristocratic circle. It was unpleasant to him, but he could do no different. Not to stop at his aunt's was to offend her. Besides, through her connections, she could be of great service to him in those affairs for the sake of which he came to St. Petersburg. What wonders I hear about you, said Countess Catherine Ivanovna Chaskaya, while Nekludov was drinking the coffee brought him immediately after his arrival. Vous posez pour un Howard. You are helping the convicts, making the rounds of the prisons, reforming them. You are mistaken. I never had such intentions. Why, that is not bad. Only I understand there is some love affair. Come, tell me. Nekludov related the story of Maslova, exactly as it happened. Yes, yes, I remember. Poor Helen told me at the time you lived at the old maid's house that I believe they wished you to marry their ward. Countess Catherine Ivanovna always hated Nekludov's aunts on his father's side. So, that is she? Elle est encore jolie? Aunt Catherine Ivanovna was a sixty-year-old, healthy, jolly, energetic, talkative woman. She was tall, very stout, with a black, downy moustache on her upper lip. Nekludov loved her and since childhood had been accustomed to get infected with her energy and cheerfulness. No, ma tante, all that belongs to the past. I only wish to help her because she is innocent, and it is my fault that she was condemned. Her whole wrecked life is upon my conscience. I feel it to be my duty to do for her what I can. But how is it? I was told that you wish to marry her. I do wish it, it is true, but she doesn't. Catherine Ivanovna raised her eyebrows and silently looked at Nekludov in surprise. Suddenly her face changed and assumed a pleased expression. Well, she is wiser than you are. Ah, what a fool you are, and you would marry her? Certainly. After what she has been? The more so, is it not all my fault? Well, you are simply a crank, said the aunt, suppressing a smile. You are an awful crank but I love you for the very reason that you are such an awful crank, she repeated, the word evidently well describing, according to her view, the mental and moral condition of her nephew. And how opportune. You know, Aline has organised a wonderful asylum for Magdalens. I visited it once. How disgusting they are. I afterward washed myself from head to foot. But Aline is caught at arm in this affair, so we will send her your Magdalen to her. If anyone will reform her, it is Aline. But she was sentenced to penal servitude. I came here for the express purpose of obtaining a reversal of her sentence. That is my first business to you. Is that so? Where is the case now? In the Senate. In the Senate? Why, my dear cousin Lavushka is in the Senate. However, he is in the heraldry department. Let me see. No, of the real ones I do not know any. Heaven knows what a mixture they are. Either Germans, such as G, Fe, D, Tul Alphabet, or all sorts of Ivanvas, Semenovs, Nikitins, or Ivaneukos, 
Semenukos, Nikitenkas, pour varier. Des gens de l'autre monde. However, I will tell my husband. He knows all sorts of people. I will tell him. You explain it to him, for he never understands me. No matter what I may say, he always says that he cannot understand me. C'est un parti pris. Everybody understands, only he does not understand. At that moment, a servant in knee breeches entered with a letter on a silver tray. Ah, that is from Aline. Now you will have an opportunity to hear Kissy Weather. Who is that Kissy Weather? Kissy Weather? Come around today and you will find out who he is. He speaks so that the most hardened criminals fall on their knees and weep and repent. Countess Catherine Ivanovna, however strange it might be, and how so little it agreed with her character, was a follower of that teaching which held that essence of Christianity consisted in a belief in redemption. She visited the meetings where sermons were delivered on this teaching then in vogue and invited the adherents to her own house. Although this teaching rejected all rites, images, and even the sacraments, the princess had images hanging in all her rooms, even over her bedstead, and she complied with all the ritual requirements of the church, seeing nothing contradictory in that. Your Magdalene ought to hear him. She would become converted, said the countess. Don't fail to come tonight. You will hear him then. He is a remarkable man. It is not interesting to me, Matanta. I tell you, it is interesting. You must come tonight. Now, what else do you want me to do? Videz votre sac. There is the man in the fortress. In the fortress? Well, I can give you a note to Baron Kriegmuth. C'est un très brave homme. But you know him yourself. He was your father's comrade. Il donne dans le spiritisme. But that is nothing. He is a kind man. What do you want there? It is necessary to obtain permission for a mother to visit her son who is incarcerated there. But I was told that Cherviansky and not Kriegmuth is the person to be applied to. I do not like Cherviansky, but he is Mariette's husband. I will ask her. She will do it for me. Elle est très gentille. There is another woman I wish you would speak to her about. She has been in prison for several months, and no one knows for what. Oh no, she herself surely knows for what. They know very well, and it serves them right, those short-haired ones. I do not know whether it serves them right or not, but they are suffering. You are a Christian, and believe in the gospel, and yet are so pitiless. That has nothing to do with it. The gospel is one thing. What I dislike is another thing. It would be worse if I pretended to like the nihilists, especially the female nihilists, when as a matter of fact I hate them. Why do you hate them? Why do they meddle in other people's affairs? It is not a woman's business. But you have nothing against Mariette occupying herself with business, said Nekludov. Mariette? Mariette is Mariette. But who is she? A conceited ignoramus who wants to teach everybody. They do not wish to teach. They only wish to help the people. We know without them who should and who should not be helped. But the people are impoverished. I have just been in the country. Is it proper that peasants should overwork themselves without getting enough to eat while we are living in such wasteful luxury? What do you wish me to do? You would like to see me work and not eat anything? No, I do not wish you not to eat, smiling involuntarily, answered Nekludov. I only wish that we should all work, and all have enough to eat. The aunt again raised her eyebrows and gazed at him with curiosity. Mon cher, vous finirez mal, she said. At that moment, a tall, broad-shouldered general entered the room. It was Countess Chaskaya's husband, a retired minister of state. Ah, Dmitri, how do you do, he said, putting out his clean-shaven cheek. When did you get here? He silently kissed his wife on the forehead. Non, il est impayable. Countess Catherine Ivanovna turned to her husband. He wants me to do washing on the river and feast on potatoes. He is an awful fool, but nevertheless, do for him what he asks. An awful crank, she corrected herself. By the way, they say that Kamenskaya is in a desperate condition. Her life is despaired of, she turned to her husband. You ought to visit her. Yes, it is awful, said the husband. Go now, 
and have a talk together. I must write some letters. Nekludov had just reached the room next to the reception room when she shouted after him, Shall I write then to Mariette? If you please, ma tante. Yeah. I will learn that which you want to say about the short-haired en blanc, and she will have her husband attend to it. Don't think that I am angry. They are hateful, your protégés, but je ne le veux pas de mal. But God forgive them. Now go, and don't forget to come in the evening. You will hear Kizi weather. We will also pray. And if you do not resist, qu'à vous faire beaucoup de bien. I know that Helen and all of you are very backward in that respect. Now, au revoir. Chapter 67 The man in whose power it was to lighten the condition of the prisoners in St. Petersburg had earned a great number of medals, which, except for a white cross in his buttonhole, he did not wear, however. The old general was of the German barons and, as it was said of him, had become childish. He had served in the Caucasus, where he had received this cross, then in Poland and in some other place, and now he held the office which gave him good quarters, maintenance and honour. He always strictly carried out the orders of his superiors and considered their execution of great importance and significance, so much so that while everything in the world could be changed, these orders, according to him, were above the possibility of any alteration. As Nekhludoff was approaching the old general's house, the tower clock struck too. The general was at the time sitting with a young artist in the darkened reception room at a table, the top of which was of inlaid work, both of them turning a saucer on a sheet of paper. Holding each other's fingers over the saucer, placed face downward, they pulled in different directions over the paper on which were printed all the letters of the alphabet. The saucer was answering the general's question, how would souls recognize each other after death? At the moment, one of the servants entered with Nekhludoff's card. The soul of Jeanne d'Arc was speaking through the saucer. The soul had already said, they will recognize each other, which was duly entered on a sheet of paper. When the servant entered, the saucer, stopping first on the letter P, then on the letter O, reached the letter S and began to jerk one way and another. That was because, as the general thought, the next letter was to be L, that is to say, Jeanne d'Arc, according to his idea, intended to say that souls would recognize each other only after they had been purged of everything mundane, or something to that effect, and that therefore the next letter ought to be, well, poesel, I, I, E, after. The artist, on the other hand, thought that the next letter would be V, that the soul intended to say that souls would recognize each other by the light, poes v, year two, that would issue from the ethereal body of the souls. The general, gloomily knitting his brow, gazed fixedly on the hands, and imagining that the saucer moved itself, pulled it toward the letter L. The young, anaemic artist, with his oily hair brushed behind his ears, looked into the dark corner of the room, with his blue, dull eyes, and nervously twitching his lips, pulled toward the letter V. The general frowned at the interruption and, after a moment's silence, took the card, put on his pince-nez, and groaning from pain in his loins, rose to his full height, rubbing his benumbed fingers. Show him into the cabinet. Permit me, Your Excellency, to finish it myself, said the artist, rising. I feel a presence. Very well, finish it, said the general with austerity, and went with firm, long strides into the cabinet. Glad to see you, said the general in a rough voice to Nekhludoff, pointing to an armchair near the desk. How long have you been in St. Petersburg? Nekhludoff said that he had but lately arrived. Is your mother the princess well? My mother is dead. Beg pardon, I was very sorry. My son told me that he had met you. The general's son was making the same career as his father and was very proud of the business with which he was entrusted. Why, I served with your father. We were friends, comrades. Are you in service? No, I am not. The general disapprovingly shook his head. I have a request to make of you, general, said Nekhludoff. Very glad. What can I do for you? If my request be out of season, please forgive me, but I must state it. What is it? 
There is a man, Gurkovich, kept in prison under your jurisdiction. His mother asks to be permitted to visit him, or at least to send him books. The general expressed neither satisfaction nor dissatisfaction at Nekhludoff's request, but, inclining his head to one side, seemed to reflect. As a matter of fact, he was not reflecting. Nekhludoff's question did not even interest him, knowing very well that his answer would be as the law requires. He was simply resting mentally without thinking of anything. That is not in my discretion, you know, he said, having rested a while. There is a law relating to visits, and whatever that law permits, that is permitted. And as to books, there is a library, and they are given such books as are allowed. Yes, but he wants scientific books. He wishes to study. Don't believe that. The general paused. It is not for study that they want them, but so it is simply unrest. But their time must be occupied somehow. They are always complaining, retorted the general. We know them. He spoke of them in general as of some peculiar race of people. They have such conveniences here as is seldom seen in a prison, he continued. And as though justifying himself, he began to recount all the conveniences enjoyed by the prisoners in a manner to make one believe that the chief aim of the institution consisted in making it a pleasant place of abode. Formerly, it is true, the regulations were very harsh, but now their condition is excellent. They get three dishes, one of which is always of meat, chopped meat or cutlet. Sundays they get a fourth dish, dessert. May God grant that every Russian could feed so well. The general, like all old men, evidently having committed to memory the oft-repeated words, proceeded to prove how exacting and ungrateful the prisoners were by repeating what he had told many times before. They are furnished books on spiritual topics, also old journals. We have a library of suitable books, but they seldom read them. At first they appear to be interested, and then it is found that the pages of all the new books are barely half cut, and of the old ones there is no evidence of any thumb marks at all. We even tried, with a remote semblance of a smile, the general continued, to put a piece of paper between the pages, and it remained untouched. Writing, too, is allowed. A slate is given them, also a slate pencil, so that they may write for diversion. They can wipe it out and write again, and yet they don't write. No, they become quiet very soon. At first they are uneasy, but afterward they even grow stout and become very quiet. Nekhludoff listened to the hoarse, feeble voice, looked on that fleshless body, those faded eyes under the grey eyebrows, those sunken, shaved cheeks, supported by a military collar, that white cross, and understood that to argue and explain to him the meaning of those words were futile. But making another effort, he asked him about the prisoner, Shustova, whose release he had received information, had been ordered through the efforts of Mariette. Shustova! Shustova! I don't remember them all by name. There are so many of them, he said, evidently reproving them for being so numerous. He rang the bell and called for the secretary. While a servant was going after the secretary, he admonished Nekhludoff to go into service, saying that the country was in need of honest, noble men. I am old, and yet I am serving to the extent of my ability. The secretary came and reported that there were no papers received relating to Shustova, who was still in prison. As soon as we receive an order, we release them the very same day. We do not keep them. We do not particularly value their presence, said the general, again with a waggish smile, which had the effect only of making his face wry. Goodbye, my dear he continued. Don't be offended for advising you, for I do so only because I love you. Have nothing to do with the prisoners. You will never find innocent people among them. They are the most immoral set. We know them, he said, in a tone of voice which did not permit the possibility of doubt. You had better take an office. The emperor and the country need honest people. What if I and such as you refuse to serve? Who would be left? We are complaining of conditions, but refuse to aid the government. Nekhludoff sighed deeply, made a low bow, pressed the bony hand condescendingly extended, and departed. The general disapprovingly shook his head, 
and rubbing his loins, went to the reception room, where the artist awaited him with the answer of Jeanne d'Arc. The general put on his pince-nez and read, They will recognize each other by the light issuing from the ethereal bodies. Ah, said the general approvingly, closing his eyes. But how will one recognize another when all have the same light, he asked, and again, crossing his fingers with those of the artist, seated himself at the table. Nekhludoff's driver drove up to the gate. It is very dull here, sir, he said, turning to Nekhludoff. It was very tiresome, and I was about to drive away. Yes, tiresome, assented Nekhludoff with a deep sigh, resting his eyes on the clouds and the Neva, dotted with variegated boats and steamers. Chapter 68 With a note from Prince Ivan Mikhailovich, Nekhludoff went to Senator Wolf, and home très comme il faut, as the prince had described him. Wolf had just breakfasted and, as usual, was smoking a cigar to aid his digestion when Nekhludoff arrived. Vladimir Vasilievich Wolf was really un homme très comme il faut, and this quality he placed above all else. From the height of it, he looked upon all other people and could not help valuing this quality, because thanks to it, he had gained a brilliant career, the same career he strove for. That is to say, through marriage, he obtained a fortune which brought him a yearly income of 18,000 roubles, and by his own efforts he obtained a senatorship. He considered himself not only an homme très comme il faut, but a man of chivalric honesty. By honesty he understood the refusal to take bribes from private people, but to do everything in his power to obtain all sorts of travelling expenses, rents and disbursements he did not consider dishonest nor did he consider it dishonest to rob his wife and sister-in-law of their fortunes. On the contrary, he considered that a wise arrangement of his family affairs. The home circle of Vladimir Vasilievich consisted of his characterless wife, her sister, whose fortune he managed to get into his own hands by selling her property and depositing the money in his own name, and his gentle, scared, homely daughter, who was leading a solitary, hard life and whose only diversion consisted in visiting the religious meetings at Aline's and Countess Catherine Ivanovna's. The son of Vladimir Vasilievich, a good-natured, bearded boy of fifteen, who at that age had already commenced to drink and lead a depraved life, which lasted till he was twenty years old, was driven from the house for the reason that he did not pass examinations in any school, and keeping bad company, and, running into debt, he had compromised his father. The father paid once for his son 230 roubles and paid 600 roubles a second time, but declared that that was the last time, and if the son did not reform, he would drive him from the house and have nothing to do with him. Not only did the son not reform, but contracted another debt of a thousand roubles and told his father that he did not care if he was driven from the house since life at home was torture to him. Then Vladimir Vasilievich told his son that he could go where he pleased, that he was no longer his son. Since then, no one in the house dared to speak of his son to him, and Vladimir Vasilievich was quite certain that he had arranged his family affairs in the best possible manner. Wolf, with a flattering and somewhat derisive smile, it was an involuntary expression of his consciousness of his comme il faut superiority, halted in his exercise long enough to greet Nekhludoff and read the note. Please take a seat, but you must excuse me. If you have no objection, I will walk, he said, putting his hands in the pockets of his jacket and treading lightly up and down the diagonal of the large cabinet, furnished in an austere style. Very glad to make your acquaintance, and of course to please the Count Ivan Mikhailovich, emitting the fragrant blue smoke, and carefully removing the cigar from his mouth so as not to lose the ashes. I would like to ask you to hasten the hearing of the appeal, because if the prisoner is to go to Siberia, it would be desirable that she go as soon as possible, said Nekhludoff. Yes, yes, with the first steamer from Nizhny. I know, said Wolf, with his condescending smile, who always knew everything in advance, whatever the subject mentioned to him. What is the name of the prisoner? Maslova. Wolf walked to the table and looked into the papers. That's right. 
Maslova. Very well. I will ask my associates. We will hear the case Wednesday. May I wire my lawyer? So you have a lawyer? What for? But if you wish it, all right. The grounds of appeal may be insufficient, said Nekludov, but I think it may be seen from the case that the sentence was the result of a misunderstanding. Yes, yes, that may be so, but the Senate cannot enter into the merits of the case, said Vladimir Vasilievich sternly, glancing at the ashes of his cigar. The Senate only looks after the proper interpretation and application of the law. This, I think, is an exceptional case. I know, I know. All cases are exceptional. We will do what the law requires. That is all. The ashes were still intact, but had already cracked and were in danger of collapse. And do you often visit St. Petersburg? asked Wolf, holding the cigar so that the ashes would not fall. The ashes were unstable, however, and Wolf carefully carried them to the ash holder, into which they were finally precipitated. What an awful catastrophe Kamensky met with, said Wolf. A fine young man and an only son, especially the condition of the mother. He went on repeating almost word for word the story of a duel of which all St. Petersburg was talking at the time. After a few more words about Countess Catherine Ivanovna and her passion for the new religious tendency, which Vladimir Vasilievich neither praised nor condemned, but which, for un homme très comme il faut, was evidently superfluous, he rang the bell. Nekhludoff bowed himself out. If it is convenient for you, come to dinner, said Wolf, extending his hand. Say on Wednesday. I will then give you a definite answer. It was already late, and Nekhludoff drove home, that is, to his aunts. Chapter 69 Maslova's case was to be heard the following day, and Nekhludoff went to the Senate. He met Fanirin at the entrance to the magnificent Senate building, where several carriages were already waiting. Walking up the grand, solemn staircase to the second floor, the lawyer, who was familiar with all the passages, turned into a room to the left, on the door of which was carved the year of the institution of the code. The lawyer removed his overcoat, remaining in his dress coat and black tie on a white bosom, and with cheerful self-confidence walked into the next room. There were about fifteen spectators present, among whom were a young woman in a pince-nez and a grey-haired lady, a grey-haired old man of patriarchal mien wearing a box coat and grey trousers, and attended by two men attracted particular attention. He crossed the room and entered a wardrobe. An usher, a handsome man with red cheeks and in a pompous uniform, approached Fanarin with a piece of paper in his hand and asked him in what case he appeared. Being told that in Maslova's case, the usher made a note of something and went away. At that time, the door of the wardrobe opened and the patriarchal-looking old man came forth, no longer in the coat, but in a brilliant uniform which made him resemble a bird. His uniform evidently embarrassed the old man, and he walked into the room opposite the entrance with quicker than his ordinary step. Fanirin pointed him out to Nekhludoff as Bey, a most honourable gentleman. The spectators, including Fanirin, went into the next room and seated themselves behind the grating on benches reserved for spectators. Only the St. Petersburg lawyer took a seat behind a desk on the other side of the grating. The session room of the Senate was smaller than the room of the circuit court, was furnished in simpler style, only the table behind which the senators sat was of crimson plush instead of green cloth bordered with gold lace. There were four senators. The president, Nikitin, with a closely shaved, narrow face and steel-grey eyes. Wolf, with thin lips and small white hands, with which he was turning over the papers before him. Then Skovorodnikov, stout, massive and pockmarked, and a very learned jurist, and finally, Bey, the same patriarchal old man who was the last to arrive. Immediately behind the senators came the chief secretary and associate attorney general. He was a young man of medium height, shaved, lean, with a very dark face and black, sad eyes. Nekhludoff recognised him notwithstanding his strange uniform and the fact that he had not seen him for about six years as one of his best friends during his student life. 
Is the associate's name Selenin? he asked the lawyer. Yes, why? I know him very well. He is an excellent man. And a good associate of the Attorney General, very sensible. It would have been well to see him, said Fenirin. At all events, he will follow the dictates of his conscience, said Nekludov, remembering his close relations with and friendship for Selenin and the latter's charming qualities of purity, honesty and good breeding in the best sense of the word. The first case before the Senate was an appeal from the decision of the Circuit Court of Appeals affirming a judgment in favour of the publisher of a newspaper in a libel suit brought against him. Nekludov listened and tried to understand the arguments in the case, but as in the Circuit Court, the chief difficulty in understanding what was going on was found in the fact that the discussion centred not on what appeared naturally to be the main point, but on side issues. The libel consisted in an article accusing the president of a stock company of swindling. It seemed, then, that the main point to consider was whether or not the president was guilty of swindling the stockholders and what was to be done to stop his swindling. But this was never mentioned. The questions discussed were, had the publisher the legal right to print the article of its reporter? What crime has he committed by printing it, defamation or libel? And does defamation include libel or libel defamation? And a number of other things unintelligible to ordinary people, including various laws and decisions of some general department. The only thing Nekludov did understand was that though Wolf had sternly suggested but yesterday that the Senate could not consider the substance of a case, in the case at bar he argued with evident partiality in favour of reversing the judgment and that Selenin, in spite of his characteristic reserve, argued in favour of affirming the judgment with unexpected fervour. The cause of Selenin's ardour lay in the fact that that he knew the president of the stock company to be dishonest in money affairs, while he accidentally learned that Wolf, almost on the eve of the hearing of the case, had attended a sumptuous dinner at the president's house. And now, when Wolf, though with great caution, showed undoubted partiality, Selenin became excited and expressed his opinion with more nervousness than an ordinary case would justify. Wolf was evidently offended by the speech. He twitched nervously, changed colour, made silent gestures of wonder, and with an haughty air of being offended, he departed with the other senators into the deliberation room. What case are you interested in? The usher again asked Fenirin as soon as the senators had left the room. I have already told you that I am here in behalf of Maslova. That is so. The case will be heard today. But... What is that? asked the lawyer. You see, the case was to be argued without counsel so that the senators would hardly consider it in open session. But I will announce. And he made a note on the piece of paper. The senators really intended, after announcing their decision in the libel case, to consider the other cases, including Maslova's, while drinking their tea and smoking cigarettes in the consultation room. Chapter 70 as soon as the senators seated themselves at the table in the consultation room, Wolf began to set forth in an animated manner the grounds upon which he thought the case ought to be reversed. The president, always an ill-natured man, was in a particularly bad humour today. While listening to the case during the session, he formed his opinion and sat, absorbed in his thoughts, without listening to Wolf. These thoughts consisted in a recollection of what note he had made the other day in his memoirs anent the appointment of Vilyanov to an important post which he desired for himself. The president, Nikitin, quite sincerely thought that the officials with whom his duties brought him in contact were worthy of a place in history. Having written an article the other day, in which some of these officials were vehemently denounced for interfering with his plan to save Russia from ruin, as he put it, but in reality for interfering with his getting a larger salary than he was now getting, he was now thinking that posterity would give an entirely new interpretation to that incident. Why, certainly, he said to Wolf, who was addressing him, although he did not hear what Wolf said. Bay listened to Wolf with a sad face drawing garlands on a piece of paper which lay before him. Bay was a liberal of the deepest dye. 
He scarcely held to the traditions of the sixties, and if he ever deviated from strict impartiality, it was invariably in favour of liberality. Thus, in this case, besides the consideration that the complaining president of the stock company was an unclean man, Bay was in favour of affirming the judgment, also because this charge of libel against a journalist was a restriction on the freedom of the press. When Wolfe had finished his argument, Bay, leaving the garland unfinished, in a sad, it was sad for him to be obliged to prove such truisms, soft, pleasant voice, convincingly proved in a few simple words that the charge had no foundation, and again, drooping his hoary head, continued to complete the garland. Skovorodnikov, who was sitting opposite Wolf, continually gathering with his thick fingers his beard and moustache into his mouth, as soon as Bay was through with his argument, stopped chewing his beard, and, in a loud, rasping voice, said that although the president of the stock company was a villain, he should favour a reversal if there were legal grounds to sustain it. But as there were none, he joined in the opinion of Ivan Semenovich, Bay, and he invariably rejoiced at this shot aimed at Wolf. The president supported Skovorodnikov's opinion, and the judgment was confirmed. Wolf was dissatisfied especially because by this judgment he seemed to stand convicted of arguing in bad faith. But feigning indifference, he opened his papers in the next case, Maslova's, and began to peruse it attentively. The other senators in the meantime called for tea and began a talk about Kamensky's duel and his death, which was then the subject of conversation throughout the city. The usher entered and announced the desire of the lawyer and Nekhludoff to be present at the hearing of the case. This case here, said Wolf, is a whole romantic story, and he related what he knew of Nekhludoff's relations to Maslova. After talking a while of the story, smoking cigarettes and finishing their tea, the senators returned to the session room, announced their decision in the preceding case, and began to consider Maslova's case. Wolf very circumstantially set forth Maslova's appeal from the sentence, and again not without partiality, but with the evident desire to reverse the judgment. Have you anything to add? the president asked Fanirin. Fanirin rose, and projecting his broad, starched front with remarkable precision of expression, began to discuss the errors of the court below in the application of the law on the six points raised, and permitted himself, though briefly, to touch upon the merits of the case and the crying injustice of the decision. By the tone of his short but strong speech, he seemed to excuse himself, to insist that the honourable senators with their power of penetration and judicial wisdom saw and understood better than he, but that he was speaking only because his duties demanded it. After Fanirin's speech, there seemed to be no doubt left that the Senate had to reverse the judgment. When he was through, Fanirin smiled triumphantly. Looking at his lawyer and seeing that smile, Nekhludoff was convinced that the case was won. But as he looked at the senators, Nekhludoff saw that Fanarin alone was smiling and triumphant. The senators and associate attorney general were neither smiling nor triumphant, but wore the air of people suffering from ennui and saying, Oh, we know these cases. You are wasting your time. They were all evidently relieved only when the lawyer had finished, and they were no longer unnecessarily detained. After the speech, the president turned to Selenin, who plainly, briefly, and accurately expressed himself against a reversal. Then the senators arose and went to consult. The senators were divided. Wolf favoured a reversal. Bay, who thoroughly understood the case, warmly argued also in favour of a reversal, and in glowing terms pictured the court scene and the misunderstanding of the jury. Nikitin, who, as usual, stood for severity and for strict formality, was against it. The whole case, then, depended on Skovorodnikov's vote, and his vote was thrown against a reversal, principally for the reason that Nekhludoff's determination to marry the girl on moral grounds was extremely repugnant to him. Skovorodnikov was a materialist, a Darwinist, and considered every manifestation of abstract morality, or, worse still, piety, not only as contemptible and absurd, but as an affront to his person. 
all this bustle about a fallen girl and the presence there in the Senate of her famous council and Nekludov himself was to him simply disgusting. And stuffing his mouth with his beard and making grimaces, he, in a very natural manner, pretended to know nothing of the entire affair, except that the grounds of appeal were insufficient and therefore agreed with the president to affirm the judgment. The appeal was denied. Chapter 71 It is awful, said Nekludov to the lawyer as they entered the waiting room. In the plainest possible case they cavil at idle forms. It is awful. The case was spoiled at the trial, said Fanirin. Selenin, too, was against reversal. It is awful, awful, Nekludov continued to repeat. What is to be done now? We will petition the emperor. Head it yourself while you are here. I will prepare the petition. At that moment, Wolf in his uniform and stars hung on his breast, entered the waiting room and approached Nekludov. I am sorry, my dear prince, but the grounds were insufficient, he said, shrugging his narrow shoulders, and closing his eyes, he proceeded on his way. After Wolf came Selenin, who had learned from the senators that Nekludov, his former friend, was present. I did not expect to meet you here, he said, approaching Nekludov and smiling with his lips while his eyes remained sad. And I did not know that you were the Attorney General. Associate, Selenin corrected him. But what brought you to the Senate? I came here hoping to find justice and to save an innocent woman. What woman? The case that has just been decided. Oh, the Maslova case, said Selenin an entirely groundless appeal. The question is not of the appeal, but of the woman who is innocent and undergoing punishment. Selenin sighed. Quite possible, but... It is not merely possible, but certain. How do you know? I know because I was on the jury. I know wherein we made the mistake. Selenin became thoughtful. It should have been declared on the trial, he said. I did so. It should have been made part of the record, if that had appeared in the appeal. Selenin, who was always busy and did not mingle in society, had evidently not heard of Nekludov's romance. Nekludov, however, decided not to speak to him of his relations to Maslova. But it is evident even now that the verdict was preposterous, he said. The Senate has no right to say so. If the Senate attempted to interfere with the verdicts of the courts upon its own view of the justness of the verdicts themselves, there would be greater risks of justice being miscarried than established, he said, recalling the preceding case. Besides, the verdicts of juries would lose their significance. I only know one thing, and that is that the woman is entirely innocent, and the last hope of saving her from an undeserved punishment is gone. The highest judicial institution has affirmed what was absolutely unjust. It has not affirmed because it has not and could not consider the merits of the case, said Selenin, blinking his eyes. You have probably stopped at your aunt's, he added, evidently wishing to change the subject of conversation. I learned yesterday that you were in St. Petersburg. Countess Catherine Ivanovna had invited me and you to be present at the meeting of the English preacher, said Selenin smiling only with his lips. Yes, I was present, but left with disgust, Nekludov said angrily, vexed at Selenin's leading away from the conversation. Why should you be disgusted? At all events, it is a manifestation of religious feeling, although one-sided and sectarian, said Selenin. It is such strange nonsense, said Nekludov. Well, no. The only strange thing here is that we know so little of the teachings of our church that we receive an exposition of its fundamental dogmas as a new revelation, said Selenin, as though hastening to tell his former friends his new views. Nekludov gazed at Selenin with wonder. Selenin did not lower his eyes, in which there was an expression not only of sadness, but of ill will. But we will discuss it later, said Selenin. I am coming. He turned to the usher who approached him deferentially. We must meet again, he added, sighing. But you can never be found. You will always find me at home at seven. I live on Nadiginskaya, and he mentioned the number.
It is a long time since we met, he added, again smiling with his lips. I will come if I have the time, said Nekhludoff, feeling that the man whom he had once loved was made strange and incomprehensible to him, if not hostile, by this short conversation. As student Nekhludoff knew Selenin as a dutiful son, a true friend, and for his years an educated worldly man, with great tact, always elegant and handsome, and uncommonly truthful and honest withal. He studied diligently, without any difficulty, and without the slightest ostentation, receiving gold medals for his compositions. He had made it the aim of his young life, not merely by word, but in reality, to serve others, and thought he saw his chance of doing so in government service. Systematically looking over the various activities to which he might devote his energies, he decided that he could be most useful in the legislative department and entered it. But notwithstanding his most accurate and conscientious attention to his duties, he found nothing in them to satisfy his desire to be useful. His discontent, due to the pettiness and vanity of his immediate superiors, grew until an opportunity offered to enter the Senate. He was better off in the Senate, but the same feeling of dissatisfaction pursued him. He constantly felt that things were not what he expected them to be, and what they should be. During his service in the Senate, his relations obtained for him the post of gentleman of the Emperor's bedchamber, and he was obliged to drive around in gorgeous uniform to thank various people. In this post, he felt even more than before out of place. At the same time, on the one hand, he could not refuse the appointment, because he would not disappoint those who thought they were pleasing him by it, and on the other hand, the appointment flattered his vanity. It pleased him to see himself in a looking-glass, in a gold-embroidered uniform, and to receive the tokens of respect shown him by some people on his appointment. The same thing happened with respect to his marriage. A brilliant match was arranged for him, as it is regarded from the world's standpoint and he married principally because to refuse would have been to offend and cause pain to the bride and those who had arranged the match. Hence the marriage to a young, pretty, distinguished girl flattered his vanity and gave him pleasure. But the marriage soon turned out to be not the thing, you know, more so even than court service. After her first child, his wife did not wish to have any more and plunged into luxurious social life in which he was obliged to participate Nolan's Volans. Although this poisoned the life of her husband and brought her only exertion and fatigue, she nevertheless diligently pursued it. All his efforts to change her mode of life could not alter her confidence, supported by all her relatives and acquaintances, that it was quite proper. The child, a girl with long golden curls, was an entire stranger to her father mainly because she was brought up not in accord with his desires. The result was the customary misunderstanding between the husband and wife, and even in a want of desire to understand each other, and a quiet, silent struggle, hidden from strangers and tempered by propriety, which made Selenin's life at home very burdensome. So that his family life turned out to be not the thing, you know, in still greater degree than his service or the court appointment. These were the reasons why his eyes were always sad. And this was why, seeing Nekhludoff, whom he had known before all these lies had fastened themselves upon him, he thought of himself as he had been then, and more than ever felt the discord between his character and his surroundings, and he became painfully sad. The same feeling came over Nekhludoff after the first impression of joy at meeting an old friend, that was why, having promised that they would meet each other, neither sought that meeting, nor had they seen each other on this visit of Nekhludoff to St. Petersburg. Chapter 72 On leaving the Senate, Nekhludoff and his lawyer walked along the sidewalk. Fanirin told his driver to follow him, and he began to relate to Nekhludoff how the mistress of so-and-so had made millions on change, how so-and-so had sold, and another had bought his wife. He also related some stories of swindling and all sorts of crimes committed by well-known people who were not occupying cells in prison, but president's chairs in various institutions. These stories, of which he seemed to possess an inexhaustible source, afforded the lawyer great pleasure, 
as showing most conclusively that the means employed by him as a lawyer to make money were perfectly innocent in comparison with those used by the more noted public men of St. Petersburg. And the lawyer was greatly surprised when Nekhludoff, in the middle of one of these stories, hailed a trap, took leave and drove home. Nekhludoff was very sad. He was sad because the Senate's judgment continued the unreasonable suffering of the innocent Maslova and also because it made it more difficult for him to carry out his unalterable intention of joining his fate to hers. His sadness increased as the lawyer related with so much pleasure the frightful stories of the prevailing wickedness. Besides, the unkind, cold, repelling gaze of the once charming, open-hearted and noble Selenin constantly recurred to his mind. Nekhludoff, after the impressions of his stay in St. Petersburg, was almost in despair of ever reaching any results. All the plans he had laid out in Moscow seemed to him like those youthful dreams which usually end in disappointment. However, he considered it his duty, while in St. Petersburg, to exhaust his resources in endeavouring to fulfil his mission. Soon after he reached his room, a servant called him upstairs for tea. Mariette, in a multicoloured dress, was sitting beside the countess, sipping tea. On Nekhludoff's entering the room, Mariette had just dropped some funny, indecent joke. Nekhludoff noticed it by the character of their laughter. The good-natured, moustached countess Catherine Ivanovna was shaking in all her stout body with laughter, while Mariette, with a particularly mischievous expression, and her energetic and cheerful face somewhat bent to one side, was silently looking at her companion. You will be the death of me, said the countess in a fit of coughing. No sooner had Nekhludoff seated himself than Mariette, noticing the serious and slightly displeased expression on his face, immediately changed not only her expression, but her frame of mind. This was with the intention she had in mind since she first saw him, to get him to like her. She suddenly became grave, dissatisfied with her life, seeking something, striving after something. She not merely feigned, but actually induced in herself a state of mind similar to that in which Nekhludoff was, although she would not be able to say what it consisted of. In a sympathetic conversation about the injustice of the strong, the poverty of the people, the awful condition of the prisoners, she succeeded in rousing in him the least expected feeling of physical attraction, and under the din of conversation their eyes plainly queried, Can you love me? And they answered, Yes, I can. On leaving, she told him that she was always ready to be of service to him, and asked him to visit her at the theatre the next day, if only for a minute, saying that she wished to have a talk with him on a matter of importance. When will I see you again? she added, sighing and carefully putting the gloves on her ring-bedecked hand. Tell me that you will come. Nekhludoff promised to come. For a long time that night, Nekhludoff could not fall asleep. When he recalled Maslova, the decision of the Senate, and his determination to follow her, when he recalled his relinquishment of his right to the land, there suddenly appeared before him, as if in answer to these questions, the face of Mariette, her sigh and glance when she said, When will I see you again? And her smile, all so distinct that she seemed to stand before him, and he smiled himself. Would it be proper for me to follow her to Siberia? And would it be proper to deprive myself of my property? He asked himself and the answers to these questions on that bright St. Petersburg night were indefinite. His mind was all in confusion. He called forth his former trend of thought, but those thoughts had lost their former power of conviction. And what if all my ideas are due to an overwrought imagination, and I should be unable to live up to them? If I should repent of what I have done, he asked himself, and being unable to find answers to these questions, he was stricken with such sadness and despair as he had rarely experienced before, and he fell into that deep slumber which had been habitual with him after heavy losses at cards. Chapter 73 Nekhludoff's first feeling on rising the following morning was that he had committed something abominable the preceding evening. He began to recall what had happened. There was nothing abominable. He had done nothing wrong. He had only thought that all his present intentions, 
that of marrying Katyusha, giving the land to the peasants, artificial, unnatural, and that he must continue to live as he had lived before. He could recall no wrong act, but he remembered what was worse than a wrong act. There were the bad thoughts in which all bad acts have their origin. Bad acts may not be repeated. One may repent of them, while bad thoughts give birth to bad acts. A bad act only smooths the way to other bad acts, while bad thoughts irresistibly lead toward them. Recalling his thoughts of the day before, Nekhludoff wondered how he could have believed them. How so novel and difficult might be that which he intended to do, he knew that it was the only life possible to him now, and that, however easy it might be for him to return to his old mode of life, he knew that that was death, not life. This temptation of the day before was similar to that of a man who, after a night's sound sleep, feels like taking his ease on the soft mattress for a while, although he knows that it is time to be up and away on an important affair. Nekhludoff would have left the same evening, but for his promise to Mariette to visit her at the theatre. Though he knew that it was wrong to do it, he went there, contrary to the dictates of his own conscience, considering himself bound to keep his word, Besides his wish to see Mariette again, he also wished, as he thought, to measure himself against that world lately so near, but now so strange to him. Could I withstand these temptations? he thought, but not with entire sincerity. I will try it for the last time. Attired in a dress coat, he arrived in the theatre where the eternal Damo Camellia was being played. A French actress was showing in a novel way how consumptive women die. Nekhludoff was shown to the box occupied by Mariette. In the corridor, a liveried servant bowed and opened the door for him. All the spectators in the circle of boxes, sitting and standing, grey-haired, bald and pomaded heads, were intently following the movements of a slim actress making wry faces and in an unnatural voice reading a monologue. Someone hissed when the door was opened, and two streams of cold and warm air were wafted on Nekhludoff's face. In the box he found Mariette and a strange lady with a red mantle over her shoulders and high headdress, and two men, a general, Mariette's husband, a handsome, tall man with a high, artificial military breast, and a flaxen-haired, bald-headed man with shaved chin and solemn side-whiskers. Mariette, graceful, slim, elegant, décolleté, with her strong, muscular shoulders sloping down from the neck, at the jointure of which was a darkening little mole, immediately turned around, and pointing with her fan to a chair behind her, greeted him with a welcome, grateful, and, as it seemed to Nekhludoff, significant smile. Her husband calmly, as was his wont, looked at Nekhludoff and bowed his head. In the glance which he exchanged with his wife, as in everything else, he looked the master, the owner, of a beautiful woman. There was a thunder of applause when the monologue ended. Mariette rose, and holding in one hand her rustling silk skirt, walked to the rear of the box and introduced Nekhludoff to her husband. The general incessantly smiled with his eyes, said he was glad, and remained calm and mute. I had to leave today, but I promised you said Nekhludoff, turning to Mariette. If you don't wish to see me, you will see a remarkable actress, Mariette said, answering the meaning of his words. Wasn't she great in the last scene? She turned to her husband. The general bowed his head. That does not affect me, said Nekhludoff. I have seen so much real misfortune today that... Sit down and tell us what you have seen. The husband listened and ironically smiled with his eyes. I went to see that woman who has been released. She is entirely broken down. That is the woman of whom I have spoken to you, Mariette said to her husband. Yes, I was very glad that she could be released, he calmly said, nodding his head and smiling ironically, as it seemed to Nekhludoff under his moustache. I will go to the smoking room. Nekhludoff waited, expecting that Mariette would tell him that something which she said she had to tell him, but instead... She only jested and talked of the performance, which, she thought, ought to affect him particularly. Nekhludoff understood that the only purpose for which she had brought him to the theatre was to display her evening toilet with her shoulders and mole, 
and he was both pleased and disgusted. Now he saw what was under the veil of the charm that at first attracted him. Looking on Mariette, he admired her, but he knew that she was a prevaricator who was living with her career-making husband, that what she had said the other day was untrue, and that she only wished, and neither knew why, to make him love her. And, as has been said, he was both pleased and disgusted. Several times he attempted to leave, took his hat, but still remained. But finally, when the general, his thick moustache reeking with tobacco, returned to the box and glanced at Nekhludoff patronizingly disdainful as if he did not recognize him, Nekhludoff walked out before the door closed behind the general and, finding his overcoat, left the theatre. On his way home, he suddenly noticed before him a tall, well-built, loudly dressed woman. Every passerby turned to look at her. Nekhludoff walked quicker than the woman and also involuntarily looked her in the face. Her face, probably rouged, was pretty. Her eyes flashed at him and she smiled. Nekhludoff involuntarily thought of Mariette, for he experienced the same feeling of attraction and disgust which took hold of him in the theatre. Passing her hastily, Nekhludoff turned the corner of the street and, to the surprise of the policeman, began to walk up and down the waterfront. That one in the theatre also smiled that way when I entered, he thought, and the smile of the former conveyed the same meaning as that of the latter. The only difference between them is that this one speaks openly and plainly, while the other pretends to be exercising higher and refined feelings. But in reality, they are alike. This one is at least truthful, while the other is lying. Nekhludoff recalled his relations with the wife of the district commander, and a flood of shameful recollections came upon him. There is a disgusting bestiality in man, he thought, but when it is in a primitive state, one looks down upon and despises it, whether he is carried away with or withstands it. But when this same bestiality hides itself under a so-called aesthetic, poetic cover and demands to be worshipped, then deifying the beast, one gives himself up to it without distinguishing between the good and the bad. Then it is horrible. As there was no soothing, rest-giving darkness that night, but instead there was a hazy, cheerless, unnatural light. So even was there no rest-giving darkness, ignorance for Nekhludoff's soul. Everything was clear. It was plain that all that is considered important and useful is really insignificant and wicked, and that all that splendour and luxury were hiding old crimes, familiar to everyone, and not only stalking unpunished, but triumphing and adorned with all the allurements man is capable of conceiving. Nekhludoff wished to forget it, not to see it, but he could no longer help seeing it. Although he did not see the source of the light which revealed these things to him, as he did not see the source of the light which spread over St. Petersburg, and though this light seemed to him hazy, cheerless and unnatural, he could not help seeing that which the light revealed to him, and he felt at the same time both joy and alarm. Chapter 74 Immediately upon his arrival in Moscow, Nekhludoff made his way to the prison hospital, intending to make known to Maslova the Senate's decision and to tell her to prepare for the journey to Siberia. Of the petition which he brought for Maslova's signature, he had little hope, and strange to say, he no longer wished to succeed. He had accustomed himself to the thought of going to Siberia and living among the exiles and convicts, and it was difficult for him to imagine how he should order his life and that of Maslova if she were freed. The doorkeeper at the hospital, recognising Nekhludoff, immediately informed him that Maslova was no longer there. Where is she then? Why, again in the prison. Why was she transferred? asked Nekhludoff. Your Excellency knows their kind, said the doorkeeper with a contemptuous smile. She was making love to the assistant, so the chief physician sent her back. Nekhludoff did not suspect that Maslova and her spiritual condition were so close to him. This news stunned him. The feeling he experienced was akin to that which people experience when hearing suddenly of some great misfortune. He was deeply grieved. 
The first feeling he experienced was that of shame. His joyful portraying of her spiritual awakening now seemed to him ridiculous. Her reluctance to accept his sacrifice, the reproaches and the tears, were the mere cunning, he thought, of a dissolute woman who wished to make the most use of him. It seemed to him now that at his last visit he had seen in her the symptoms of incorrigibility which were now evident. All this flashed through his mind at the time he instinctively donned his hat and left the hospital. But what's to be done now? he asked himself. Am I bound to her? Am I not released now by this, her act? But no sooner did he form the question than he understood that in considering himself released and leaving her to her fate, he would be punishing not her, which he desired, but himself, and he was terrified. No, that will not alter my decision. It will only strengthen it. Let her do whatever her soul prompts her to do. If she would make love to the assistant, let her do so. It is her business. It is my business to do what my conscience demands, he said to himself, and my conscience demands that I sacrifice my liberty in expiation of my sin and my decision to marry her, although but fictitiously, and follow her wherever she may be sent, remains unaltered, he said to himself, with spiteful obstinacy, and leaving the hospital, he made his way with resolute step to the prison gate. Coming to the gate, he asked the officer on duty to tell the inspector that he wished to see Maslova. The officer knew Nekhludoff and told him an important piece of prison news. The captain had resigned, and another man, who was very strict, had taken his place. The inspector, who was in the prison at the time, soon made his appearance. He was tall, bony, very slow in his movements, and gloomy. Visitors are allowed only on certain days, he said, without looking at Nekhludoff. But I have a petition here which she must sign. You may give it to me. I must see the prisoner myself. I was always permitted to see her before. That was before, said the inspector, glancing at Nekhludoff. I have a pass from the governor, Nekhludoff insisted, producing his pocketbook. Let me see it said the inspector, without looking in Nekhludoff's eyes, and taking the document with his skinny, long, white hand, on the index finger of which there was a gold ring, he slowly read it. Walk into the office, please, he said. On this occasion, there was no one in the office. The inspector seated himself at the table, looking through the papers that lay on it, evidently intending to stay through the meeting. When Nekhludoff asked him if Bogodukovskaya could be seen, he answered, Visiting the politicals is not allowed, and again buried his head in the papers. When Maslova entered the room, the inspector raised his eyes, and without looking either at Maslova or Nekhludoff said, You may go ahead, and continued to busy himself with his papers. Maslova was again dressed in a white skirt, waist and kerchief. Coming near Nekhludoff and seeing his cold, angry face, her own turned a purple colour, and with downcast eyes, she began to pick a corner of her waist. Her confusion Nekhludoff considered as confirmation of the hospital porter's words. So abhorrent was she to him now that he could not extend his hand to her as he desired. I bring you bad news, he said in an even voice, without looking at her. The Senate affirmed the verdict. I knew it would be so, she said in a strange voice, as if choking. If it had happened before, Nekhludoff would have asked her why she knew it. Now he only looked at her. Her eyes were filled with tears, but this not only did not soften him, but made him even more inflamed against her. The inspector rose and began to walk up and down the room. Notwithstanding the abhorrence Nekhludoff felt for Maslova, he thought it proper to express his regret at the Senate's action. Do not despair, he said. This petition may be more successful, and I hope that... Oh, it is not that, she said, looking at him with the tearful and squinting eyes. What then? You have been in the hospital, and they must have told you there about me. What of it? That is your business, frowning, Nekhludoff said with indifference. The cruel feeling of offended pride rose in him with greater force at her mention of the hospital. I, a man of the world whom any girl of the upper class would be only too happy to marry, offered to become the husband of that woman, and she could not wait. 
but made love to the assistant surgeon, he thought, looking at her with hatred. Sign this petition, he said, and taking from his pocket a large envelope, placed it on the table. She wiped her tears with a corner of her kerchief, seated herself at the table, and asked him where to sign. He showed her where, and she, seating herself, smoothed with her left hand the sleeve of the right. He stood over her, silently looking at her back, bent over the table, and now and then shaking from the sobs she tried to suppress, and his soul was convulsed by a struggle between good and evil, between offended pride and pity for her sufferings. The feeling of pity conquered. Whether it was the feeling of pity that first asserted itself, or the recollection of his own deeds of the same character for which he reproached her, he scarcely knew. But suddenly he felt himself guilty and pitied her. Having signed the petition and wiped her soiled fingers on her skirt, she rose and glanced at him. Whatever the result, and no matter what happens, I shall keep my word, said Nekhludoff. The thought that he was forgiving her strengthened in him the feeling of pity and tenderness for her, and he wished to console her. I will do what I said. I will be with you wherever you may be. That's no use, she hastened to say, and her face became radiant. Make note of what you need for the road. Nothing particular, I think. Thank you. The inspector approached them, and Nekhludoff, without waiting to be told that the time was up, took leave of her, experiencing a new feeling of quiet happiness, calmness, and love for all mankind. It was the consciousness that no act of Maslova could alter his love for her that raised his spirit and made him feel happy. Let her make love to the assistant. That was her business. He loved her not for himself, but for her and for God. The lovemaking for which Maslova was expelled from the hospital and to which Nekhludoff gave credence consisted only in that, when Maslova, coming to the drug department for some pectoral herbs prescribed by her superior, she found there an assistant named Ustinov. This Ustinov had been pursuing her with his attentions for a long time, and as he tried to embrace her, she pushed him away with such force that he struck the shelving and two bottles came crashing to the floor. The chief physician was passing at the time, and hearing the sound of the breaking glass and seeing Maslova running out all flushed, he angrily shouted to her, Well, girl, if you begin to flirt here, I will send you back. What is the matter? He turned to the assistant, sternly looking over his spectacles. The assistant, smiling, began to apologise. The doctor, without hearing him to the last, raised his head so that he began to look through the glasses and walked into the ward. On the same day, he asked the inspector to send a more sedate nurse in place of Maslova. Maslova's expulsion from the hospital on the ground of flirting was particularly painful to her by reason of the fact that, after her meeting with Nekhludoff, all association with men, which had been so repugnant to her, became even more disgusting. The fact that, judging her by her past and present condition, everybody, including the pimpled assistant, thought that they had the right to insult her and were surprised when she refused their attentions, was very painful to her and called forth her tears and pity for herself. Now, coming out to see Nekhludoff, she wished to explain the injustice of the charge which he had probably heard. But as she attempted to do so, she felt that he would not believe her, that her explanation would only tend to corroborate the suspicion, and her tears welled up in her throat, and she became silent. Maslova was still thinking, and continued to assure herself that, as she had told him on his second visit, she had not forgiven him, that she hated him, but in reality she had long since begun to love him again, and loved him so that she involuntarily carried out his wishes. She ceased to drink and smoke, she gave up flirting, and willingly went as servant to the hospital. All this she did because she knew he wished it. Her repeated refusal to accept his sacrifice was partly due to the fact that she wished to repeat those proud words which she had once told him, and mainly because she knew that their marriage would make him unhappy. She was firmly resolved not to accept his sacrifice, and yet it was painful for her to think that he despised her, that he thought her to be the same as she had been, and did not see the change she was undergoing. 
The fact that he was at that moment thinking that she did something wrong in the hospital pained her more than the news that she was finally sentenced to hard labour. Chapter 75 Maslova might be sent away with the first party of exiles. Hence, Nekludov was preparing for departure, but he had so many things to attend to that he felt that he could never get through with them, no matter how much time there might be left for preparations. It was different in former times. Then it was necessary to devise something to do, and the interest in all his affairs centred in Dmitri Ivanovich Nekludov. But though all interest in life centred in Dmitri Ivanovich, he always suffered from ennui. Now, however, all his affairs related to people other than Dmitri Ivanovich and were all interesting and attractive, as well as inexhaustible. Besides, formerly the occupation with the affairs of Dmitri Ivanovich always caused vexation and irritation, while these affairs of others, for the most part, put him in a happy mood. Nekludov's affairs were now divided into three parts. He himself, in his habitual pedantism, thus divided them and according placed them in three different portfolios. The first was that of Maslova. This consisted in efforts to obtain a successful result in the pending petition and preparations for departure to Siberia. The second part related to the settlement of his estates. The Panov land was granted to the peasants on condition of their paying a rent to be used for common necessities. But, in order to complete that arrangement, it was necessary to sign an agreement and also make his will. The arrangement made for the Kuzminskoy estate was to remain in force, only there remained to be determined what part of the rent he was to appropriate to himself and what was to be left for the benefit of the peasants. Without knowing what his necessary disbursements would be on his trip to Siberia, he could not make up his mind to deprive himself of his income, although he reduced it by one half. The third part related to aid to prisoners, who were now applying to him more and more frequently. At first, when written to for aid, he proceeded immediately to intercede for the applicants, endeavouring to relieve their condition. But in the end, their number became so great that he found it impossible to help everyone and was involuntarily brought to a fourth matter which had of late occupied him more than either of the others. His fourth concern consisted in solving the question why, how and whence came that remarkable institution called the criminal court to which was due the existence of that prison, with the inmates of which he had become somewhat familiar and all those places of confinement beginning with the fortress dedicated to two saints, Peter and Paul, and ending with the island of Sagalin, where hundreds and thousands of victims of that wonderful criminal law were languishing. From personal contact with prisoners, and from information received from the lawyer, the prison chaplain, the inspector, and from the prison register, Nekludov came to the conclusion that the prisoners, so-called criminals, could be divided into five classes. The first class consisted of people entirely innocent, victims of judicial mistakes, such as that would be Incendiary, Menshov, or Maslova, and others. There were comparatively few people of this class, according to the observations of the chaplain, about 7%, but their condition attracted particular attention. The second class consisted of people convicted for offences committed under exceptional circumstances, such as anger, jealousy, drunkenness, etc. Offences which, under similar circumstances, would almost invariably have been committed by all those who judged and punished them. This class made up, according to Nekludov's observations, more than one half of all the prisoners. To the third class belong those who committed, according to their own ideas, the most indifferent or even good acts, but which were considered criminal by people entire strangers to them who were making the laws. To this class belonged all those who carried on a secret trade in wine or were bringing in contraband goods or were picking herbs or gathering wood in private or government forests. To this class also belonged the predatory mountaineers. The fourth class consisted of people who, according to Nekludov, were reckoned among the criminals only because they were morally above the average level of society. Among these, the percentage of those who resisted interference with their affairs or were sentenced for resisting the authorities was very large. 
The fifth class, finally, was composed of people who were more sinned against by society than they sinned themselves. These were the helpless people, blunted by constant oppression and temptation, like that boy with the mats, and hundreds of others whom Nekhludoff saw both in and out of prison, and the conditions of those whose lives systematically drove them to the necessity of committing those acts which are called crimes. To these people belonged, according to Nekhludoff's observations, many thieves and murderers, with some of whom Nekhludoff had come in contact. Among these Nekhludoff found, on close acquaintance, those spoiled and depraved people whom the new school calls the criminal type, and the existence of which in society is given as the reason for the necessity of criminal law and punishment. These so-called depraved types, deviating from the normal, were, according to Nekhludoff, none other than those very people who have sinned less against society than society has sinned against them, and against whom society has sinned not directly, but through their ancestors. Nekhludoff's attention was attracted by a habitual thief, Okhotin, who came under this head. He was the son of a fallen woman, had grown up in lodging houses, until the age of thirty had never met a moral man. In childhood he had fallen in with a gang of thieves, but he possessed a humorous vein which attracted people to him. While asking Nekhludoff for aid, he jested at himself, the judges, the prison, and all the laws, not only criminal, but even divine. There was also a fine-looking man, Fedorf, who, in company with a gang of which he was the leader, had killed and robbed an old official. This one was a peasant whose father's house had been illegally taken from him, and who, while in the army, suffered for falling in love with an officer's mistress. He was attractive and passionate. His sole desire in life was to enjoy himself, and he had never met any people who, out of any consideration, tempered their passions, nor had he ever heard that there was any other aim in life than personal enjoyment. It was plain to Nekhludoff that these two were richly endowed by nature and were only neglected and mutilated, as plants are sometimes neglected and mutilated. He also came across a vagabond and a woman whose stupidity and apparent cruelty were repulsive, but he failed to find in them that criminal type spoken of by the Italian school. He only saw in them people who were disagreeable to him personally, like some he had met in dress coats, uniforms and laces. Thus, the investigation of the question, why are people of such great variety of character confined in prisons, while others, no different than those, enjoy freedom and even judge those people, was the fourth concern of Nekhludoff. At first he hoped to find an answer to this question in books, and bought every book bearing on the subject. He bought the works of Lombroso, Garofalo, Ferry, Mansley, and Tard, and read them carefully. But the more he read them, the greater was his disappointment. The same thing happened with him that happens with people who appeal to science with direct, simple, vital questions, and not with a view of playing the part of an expounder, writer, or teacher in it. Science solved a thousand and one various abstruse, complicated questions bearing on criminal law, but failed to give an answer to the question he had formed. His question was very simple. Why and by what right do some people confine, torture, exile, flog, and kill other people no different than they are themselves? And in answer they argued the questions, whether or not man is a free agent. Can a criminal be distinguished by the measurements of his cranium? To what extent is crime due to heredity? What is morality? What is insanity? What is degeneracy? What is temperament? How does climate, food, ignorance, emulation, hypnotism, passion affect crime? What is society? What are its duties? Etc. Etc. These arguments reminded Nekhludoff of an answer he had once received from a schoolboy. He asked the boy whether he had learned the declension of nouns. Yes, answered the boy. Well, then decline poor. What poor? A dog's poor? The boy answered with a sly expression on his face. Similar answers in the form of questions Nekhludoff found in scientific books to his one basic question. He found there many wise, learned and interesting things, but there was no answer to his principal question. 
by what right do some people punish others? Not only was there no answer, but all reasoning tended to explain and justify punishment, the necessity of which was considered an axiom. Nekhludoff read much, but only by fits and starts, and the want of an answer he ascribed to such superficial reading. He, therefore, refused to believe in the justice of the answer which constantly occurred to him.